Ladies and gentlemen, during the past few weeks, I have seen your air forces in combat, and I am proud of what I have seen. When I refer to the United States Army Air Forces as your air forces, I mean it in every sense of the word. In two years, we have come up from seventh place to first place. And today, we have the largest and mightiest air force in the world. That was a job accomplished by the will and energy of the entire people of the United States. It was accomplished by our young men who left their peacetime pursuits to become pilots. Bombardier, radio technicians, gunners, by those who operated our great commercial airlines. It was accomplished by American labor, by the veterans, the newcomers, by actors, welders, typists. We welcomed anyone who was skilled, and we were grateful to those who willingly forgot their usual Sunday afternoon drive. The building of our Army Air Forces is a great achievement of a democratic people and a democratic government. Many facts have been withheld in the past for reasons of military secrecy. Some of these facts can now be given as a record of your achievements as a report of what you have done and are doing. Every American can well be proud of this record. December 7th, 1941. The Air Forces have their own reasons for remembering Pearl Harbor. In the entire Pacific area, we had left only 176 planes. We faced a formidable German Luftwaffe and a strong Japanese Air Force with an overall total less than a thousand first-line combat planes. However, though we didn't have the planes in the air, we did have them on the assembly line. Long before Pearl Harbor, the president had requested a program of 50,000 planes a year. Due to this foresight, our entry into the war found us with our design set. Many of our factories converted to war production and our bombers and fighters beginning to roll off the assembly line and we knew our planes were as good as any in the world for the latest lessons learned in Europe, such as the need for heavier armament, had been incorporated. But what about the men to fly the planes? Training was the number one problem. Lines of recruits appeared all over the country. The training commands pumped them into two main arteries. As the men arrived, schools sprang up to take them in. Air cadets went through a variety of schools preparatory to flying, while future ground crews learned a hundred different trades. Some ground men volunteered for flying jobs. Others became officers. Flyers went on to the airfields, while gunnery training was given to bombardiers, navigators, and other potential crew members. Gaining constantly in skill, individually trained men from a thousand schools poured on schedule into the operational training units. Here at last, they become units of air power. This program keeps aloft in the United States every day more than 120,000 men. Women, too, are trained to do their share. Our women pilots, the WASPs, deliver planes to home bases and perform tasks 
such as towing target sleeves for gunnery practice. Our air wax have been trained for jobs in many phases of the service. The final stage of training is reached in the operational units. Here, the individually trained men, for the first time, meet the teammates beside whom they will fight and the combat planes they will fly. They train in organizational units as large as a complete task force, simulating combat conditions. At the Florida Tactical Center, officers back from duty overseas bring new problems, new frontline techniques to be worked out and taught. Some of the refinements of skip bombing were developed here. With a modified gun sight at low altitude, the pilot shoots his bomb into the target and takes evasive action. In a few weeks, this dummy target will be an enemy tank. In a few weeks, this will be an enemy ship. When ready for combat, the individual bomber team is already part of a larger team called a squadron. Four squadrons comprise a group. Three groups, a wing. Five wings, an air division. And four divisions, a bomber command. A fighter command is built up much the same way. Another vital command is the Air Service Command. They are the boys without whom the planes would never leave the ground. To service the planes, repair shops and warehouses have been established, such as this one in England. These warehouses stock four times as many items as there are in a Sears Roebuck catalog. The service command has become the biggest export business in the world, delivering in huge quantities. This damaged fortress, Stella, is typical of the planes that come back from a mission badly in need of the air service command. For three of Stella's motors were dead, the four managed to get her back to England, but she ended up in a meadow. Stella was a mess. Until a mobile machine shop arrived. A temporary repair depot was set up and the boys of the Air Service Command went to work. After a few days, it began to look as though Stella might use a runway again. So bulldozers were moved in. A few new parts, a few more days, and... She flew again, ready to fight again thanks to the Air Service Command. The three commands are the backbone of an overseas air force. This is a global war. To understand the extent of our air operations, we must take a global point of view. You're looking at the world spread out from the North Pole. Today, we have 15 air forces, all joined together by the network of the Air Transport Command. 110,000 miles of regularly scheduled routes, four and one half times around the world. Over these routes, the ATC ferries planes from factory to front. It transports key personnel and delivers supplies at the rate of 10 million miles a month.
It will take anywhere, anything that can possibly fit into a plane. Once it delivered to Alaska, a complete hospital in 36 hours. It flew a shipment of grenades from the United States to Guadalcanal in four days when our men needed them desperately. The little extra that can turn the tide of battle. This is the daily mission of the Air Transport Command. Our 15 air forces were formed at different times for varied purposes. The first four were the backbone of our development. The first and fourth defended our coasts. The second and third were training forces. Eleven are in action overseas. Fourteen bombers were the nucleus of our first combat air force. They had escaped the Japanese drive on the Philippines. Out of bombs and ammunition, these battered early model fortresses headed for Australia, evading the swift Japanese expansion over the islands of the Pacific. This was the beginning of our 5th Air Force. The 5th is a self-made Air Force. At the start, it had to improvise with whatever facilities happened to be available in the area. <laughs> 